Honor Church, welcome once again to another great Sunday. We have an amazing day planned for you guys. We want to welcome you. For all of you who are watching us through Facebook, please share the page. We would appreciate that. For all of you who are joining us through YouTube, go ahead and uh, put any uh, comments in our commentary. And we have great leaders in the back who are willing to serve you and to lead you for any questions that you may have. Uh, today, I just want to make a quick announcement. Um, our pastors are out today, and they are celebrating the nuptials of their son, Jeremy Jr., with Amber. So first and foremost, I just want to wish you guys a happy, happy marriage. May the Lord have the hand of protection over your life, and I can't wait to see what he has done for you uh, today. I also, you know, I just want to say, you know, how amazing is, is God's love towards us? That even through this pandemic, that did not stop them from joining together in love. And that's the amazing thing that God does for you, that no matter what situation faces us, no matter where we are in our lives, that he comes in the midst of all that. He is, he is there for you and no matter what time of day. He doesn't exclude you at any time, at any moment. Just call upon the name of Christ and he shall be there for you. And, um, you know, I, I just wanted to let you guys know. I'm going to share a quick testimony on our, on our generosity. Um, it is important not only that we give of our time to the Lord, also in service, but it's also important to give in our generosity. Um, a few years ago, I was working with a company for over 16 years, and so I was comfortable in the position where I was at. And I prayed and I prayed to God that he may open a door, and it took a lot of uh, endurance, a lot of patience for me, a lot of perseverance for me to actually step out of the comfort zone. Um, at the moment, um, I was the sole giver to my family. And so it was very hard for me to make a move and not know where the Lord was going to take me to. Um, I came across this opportunity, was given an amazing, amazing raise. And I said, Lord, I said, what have you done for me? Wow, you're amazing, Lord. Three months into that, the company went bankrupt. I questioned the Lord and I asked him, God, what are you doing? What are you doing for me? What, what is it that you want me to learn out of this experience? He gave me one word and he said, trust. Trust in who I am. Trust in the word that I have already given to you. Trust and know that I'm going to make this happen for you. A year later, God opened up a door for me that I was not qualified for. I did not belong there, but it was only by the grace of God that he was able to put me in the position where no man can shut. So with today, I ask you, through your love, through your generosity, we need, we, we're doing this for you guys. This is for the community. Please, there's four we ask ways you to, you know, to join us, to just give out, to touch other lives. This is just not for ourselves, but, you know, to help out the community. So we have four ways of giving. We have the church, the Tithely app. We also have the text to give to the 833-516-003. We also um, have an online at the tccentralcoast.org. And uh, you can also mail in your checks to 1327 East Alice South Street. So with today, guys, I'm so excited. Can't wait for you guys to hear the amazing word that Pastor Lorenzo has for us today. God bless. We love you. Now let's shake some devils and get ready to worship. Stand to our feet in this place. Give God a hand, praise. Come on, lift your voices. Hallelujah! Come on, if you're ready to praise with us, just put your hands in the air and begin to thank Him for all He's done. Yes, Hallelujah, Jesus.
Come on, sing it out. You're the God who fights for me. Lord of every victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have torn apart the seas. You have led me through the deep. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Come on, somebody. Just lift those hands and give God the praise. Give him the honor, give him the glory in this place. Jesus, we lift you up, Lord. Come on, sing a cloud by day. Cloud by day is the sign that you are with me. Cloud by night has a guiding light to my feet. You found me, you freed me, held back the from my release Oh
know that there's someone that has a praise in this place. Come on, I know God has done something for you in this place. Come on, open up your mouth and begin to shout your praise. to receive you. Come on, if you're ready to receive the love of God, the grace of God, and if you're ready, just pour it out, pour out your worship and your praise into him. Just lift your hands and surrender your hearts this morning. Lord, there's nothing like your love, God. There's nothing like your power, Jesus the power that you demonstrated on the cross. We can never, ever repay you for what you did for us. But Father, we come before you in worship this morning. Because you're so worthy, Lord. In every season, God, you're worthy. In every moment of our lives, God, you've been faithful to us. this is all we can give we give it all our whole hearts Lord Round 
right now, Jesus. Right here and right now, Lord. No great could keep me 
heart will know. Sing it out. Come on with every voice. Death could not. Come on, there's no grave that could keep him. the Lord encounter. Yeah. I told the girls that needed some help singing just to let me know, but they don't. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're, we're glad to be here. Always glad to be here. I'm um, glad to see all you that uh, have made it here and all you that are tuning in uh, via the various types of social media. Uh, we do appreciate uh, the time and the effort. And um, we're excited always, always to share the word of the Lord. It's always, uh, it's always a new experience, you know, no matter. Uh, I think I preached my first sermon when I was a very young man. I was probably 19. Uh, you, were, you were there <laughs> way back then. And uh, that was, I tell you how long ago that was, but I forgot. Um, and, you know, it, it's always an exciting thing. I always feel uh, the privilege and, you know. What better thing can you do than to share some some words and hope and encouragement with God's people? And if there if ever there was a time we needed some encouragement and some hope, it is now. It is it's in the times that we're living in. But um, yeah. But I am convinced uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, um, and I'm sure you all are as well, that um, that God is King of Kings. And he is Lord of Lords. And everything and all things at some point will bow down to him. Um, I want to um, acknowledge our pastors are away. Continue to keep them in prayers. You know, congratulate uh, Pastor Jeremy Jr. You know, yes. Yeah. You know, on his, um, on his, um, on his marriage, I know... Um, 
um, he's excited and um, you know he'll come back from his honeymoon ready to preach fire I'm sure <laughs> and uh, look forward to that um, so keep them in your prayers as well um, <clears throat> as they travel from this place uh, to their next and as well as our pastors for getting back here um, safely um, and with that you know pastor has a theme <clears throat> that he wants to start and I'm going to do my best to introduce this theme um, it's going to sound like it's going one way, but I really have a thought mixed in my mind here that I'm going to try my best to make sense of it. Um, those of you who have heard of me before um, <clears throat> know that I, um, I'll do my best to break, make it simp as simple as I can. Um, but, you know, he um, really wants to get onto the theme of, you know, it is Christmas time, and he wants to get into the theme of uh, kings and crowns, you know, when the the wise men or the, the three kings went made their way to Jesus with gifts, and um, I'm gonna <coughs> I'm gonna introduce this this theme, but I'm gonna focus more on um, on the condition of the of the heart um, that that is ready to make that journey. You know, uh, we're gonna get into the pastors. Uh, our senior pastor and junior will be getting into the actual gifts and what what those meant and what those symbolized. So I won't go into that part of the story, but I want to get our hearts ready. I want to get our, our, our spirits in a place that is ready to move, you know, that is ready to give, that is ready to open up. And a lot of times, um, I think we get stuck in a place that don't let us do that. And, I, and that's what I want to address tonight. Um, I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 2. <clears throat> And it's a 1 through 13. Bear with me. It's a, little bit, it's a little bit lengthy. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are coming to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all the Jerusalem with him. And we had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the peoples together. He demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is written by the prophet. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor. Thou shalt rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had, had, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently that time the star appeared, what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them. Till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. A few things I want to focus on. First of all, they came from the east. And it came from the east. And second of all, and when they had, after they fell down and worshipped him, they opened their treasures. Yeah. I want to talk about that today. I want to talk about uh, my, my contri contribution to um, kings and crowns is that, you know, the journey into opening our treasures. You know, how do we open what we've shut down for so long? Jesus, we come before you. Thank you one more time for this opportunity. Bless the word. Anoint the ears, the mind to understand. Help me to do what I need to do in a short amount of time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so a, a story we're familiar with, right? It's Christmas time. We're, we're familiar with the wise men or the three kings. Um, I got to reading a little bit about the story. 
trying to understand um, you know, where I wanted to go because I said my job is to introduce the theme and to get the ball rolling on where the church wants to go. And I believe that God really wants to share something with us today. This is going to be one of those uh, heart-searching messages, I believe, by the time we're done. Um, I like to get excited. I like to rejoice, and we do that. We're all good, but I'd much rather you receive a word from the Lord today and let it work in your spirit. You know, I'd much rather God do the working than me just excite you. But you can get excited if you want, okay, if it's exciting to you. But change should be exciting. Pursuing God should be exciting. Having direction in your life should be exciting. A lot of times we wander without it, and that's a dangerous place to be. Um, one thing I want to talk about initially is... We don't know for certain that these three wise men, um, or that there was really only three. There could have been more. They assumed there was three because only three gifts were given, but we don't know for sure. Don't even know that they were truly kings or not, but we widely accept the narrative that they were. That's not really important to my story today, though, to what I'm trying to uh, present today. But their names, first of all, the first one was Melchior. He hailed from, the, from Persia. His name meant king. Then there was Gaspar, or Jasper, some call it. He was from India, and his name meant the bringer of treasures. And then there was Balthazar. He was from Arabia, and that means Baal protects the king. So it's interesting that there is sometimes there is power in a name. You know, um, if, you, if you put them all together, it was the king that brings treasures in protection of the king. But there was no indication that they were actual kings at all. But we do know this. We do, we do know that they came from the east. Okay? And this is important to note. Because to note, the Bible is, is particular about how it uses words, location, geography. Okay? A hill is not just a hill. It's trying to give you an example, especially in the Old Testament. A mountain is something you've got to climb, representing that there's oftentimes an uphill battle. You know? There's valleys, which oftentimes there is times of darkness and shadow and these are symbolic representations of a that have spiritual significance so I got to looking you know the Bible doesn't say a whole lot in fact only one of the gospels even mentions this particular story of the four so only Matthew chose to even write about it the others did not write about that at all so so and so there's not a whole lot to be said about them unless you go into commentaries and histories which I did all that and after a while, it just wasn't significant enough to what I was trying to say today. Um, but I was, I was reading something, and I wanted to look at that, because one thing we do know is this, that they came from the East. So the Bible has a, uh, um, a peculiar relationship with the East. It's not a specific country or political entity, just the direction. Okay, the East says, for instance, the tabernacle and the temple both faced to the east. So I guess when you entered them, you walked westward. Keep that in mind. <clears throat> the wise men saw a star in the east and traveled from the east to find the infant Jesus. The Messiah, when he arrived, was meant to come from the east, specifically the Mount of Olives, which is to the east of Jerusalem. The East is the source of blessings and divine salvation in many circumstances. But wait, people who traveled to the East actually found themselves either in trouble or causing trouble. So it's one thing to come from the East. It's another thing to go to the East. Okay? And follow me because I'm laying my foundation here. It says... Cain was exiled to the east after killing Abel. Okay? Uh, people traveled east to build the Tower of Babel, and we know how that turned out. When Abraham and Lot decided to go their separate ways, Lot went east and ended up in Sodom and Gomorrah, and we know how that turned out. The Israelites were exiled in Babylon in the east. Okay, there's a tension here, almost a paradox. How can blessing and cursing come from the same place? Because it's not about the place, it's about the direction. Okay? Follow me here. It says a paradox, because the east, but if you travel to, it says, 
it says good things come from the east but if you travel to the east you end up in a bad place so what's going on here well this is where things get a little complicated because maybe the tension isn't about geography but it's about time and movement and direction the problem is not about where you are it's about the direction you're going from where you are okay See, it's not that good a place where we're in the West and have bad places in the East. It's all about the direction traveled. But the direction traveled temporarily, not physically. You face East to see the past and the present, the realms of memory and experience. You look East to what's gone before to see God coming. But when you see him, he's traveling towards you. And if you want to stick with him, you got to move yourself. Travel towards the West, towards a future with God. If instead you move to the east, you're moving away from God to a place that God has left. Understand this. We continue to work and operate and move in the spirit because we are not concerned about where God has been. We're concerned about where God is going. And I don't want to be where God was. I want to be where God is. And sometimes I got to realize that my direction is going to determine how my blessing turns out okay so if instead you move to the east you're moving away from God to a place that God has already left and it may be an attractive place or an exciting place but God ain't there no more and sooner or later you'll find yourself in trouble you're living apart from God's blessing away from his ongoing work it is easy enough to still be in the house of God still feel the presence of God the power of God and the move of God but have no direction and still have no fire if you don't have no motive with you you can disconnect even when you still feel his presence and that is a, and that is what I want to kind of focus on today and I think God wants to take us to a place to get us out of a complacency attitude a disconnected attitude move in a direction closer to him Move in a direction where he still wants the guys, even through the tough times, even through the difficult times. Okay? So look to the east because you never know what you'll see. With this awakening within my spirit, as I begin to focus on this point that I want to make today, is that we will get, uh, this, is an this is just an introduction and a segue for the next weeks to come. We will get to the gifts and the rejoicing soon, but I want us to understand today that we can put ourselves in places that will not allow us to move forward. Not all motion is progress. A rocking chair moves all day long, but don't go nowhere. You can move all day. You can do all types of things and stay busy in, the, in God and still not move anywhere. You can still get frustrated in your faith, in your life, in your spirituality. I know I've been there. It's one thing to be inspired by powerful words, by great music, by precious promises, and by anointed gifts. But if we never leave in our minds, if we never leave in our minds, we start actually moving towards him, we will never get to him. Here's the thing. What the East told me was this, is sometimes, sometimes we let ourselves get locked in a place and we never truly come out of it. Especially when you're in a time like we are in now, in a pandemic type, type time when it's, everything is fearful, when everything is uncertain, when a lot of promises you thought, and you don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next. You don't know if you're going to be able to eat tomorrow at a restaurant. If you're not, they're going to close the malls if they're not. There's so much uncertainty. Fear has gripped the country. Fear has gripped a lot of people. But one thing I'm going to tell you this is what... I, my, my main question when I started reading the, the story of the wise men was this. What provoked them to move out of that place and make that journey? You know, and, a lot, and I know the story says that Herod sent them, or some, some versions say that Herod actually told them they had to go. But something in their spirit had to be sparked. Something they had heard and they had believed had to be kindled inside their spirit. Let me tell you something. You never move out of a situation unless something inspires you to move out of that situation. 
There's got to be something you've heard, you've seen, you've experienced that tells you, I don't really know what's going to happen once I start walking, but whatever I've heard and believed to this point has made it worth it. And I'll tell you what, I was 17 years old, the first time I ever felt the power of the Spirit of God. It didn't take me a lot of, uh, a, a lot, I didn't have to hear a long sermon. I didn't have to come back week after week. I had to receive the word that I heard. I had to make the move to an altar. And then I had to determine what I was moving towards was worth it. And you've got to ask yourself, if I'm going to give my life to God, if I'm going to have my family move in this direction, if I'm going to change the way I do things, perceive things, if I'm going to change my outlook on what my future might be, is it going to be worth it? And I'll tell you this, I have had lots of things happen in my life, good times, bad times. I've had failures. Boy, if I had time, I'd need all year to tell you about all the failures I've had. But I'll tell you what, every single time God has brought me out of that place. Every single time, it has been worth it. I can tell you without a, without a shadow of a doubt that the experience I've had have been worth it. And I'm going to tell you what, you don't trade down when you get to God. You, know, you don't go backwards because you decided to make a move towards God. No, when you move towards God, it's all for the better. It is for the good. You know what happens sometimes, though? is a lot of us are waiting for God to actually answer a prayer before we actually do something for him. And waiting for God to move us out of this place in our lives because, you know, before we actually make a decision to serve him. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> this was so quiet, but that doesn't scare me. But what stops us from moving out of the east? I got to thinking about this. You know, there's a lot of biblical stories that what this reminded me of, you know, is, um, is the times when in the Old Testament and when people would run to caves because they were afraid, you know, for one thing or another. Let me tell you something about fear. If fear grips you, it is the worst taskmaster you can possibly have. And you know what fear is? Fear is faith in the enemy. <laughs> that's what fear is. It's faith in the enemy. And that's why they're trying to spread this through people. And I, and I understand about caution. You know, I'm, I'm, not, you know, I'm not a reckless person. I, I understand about caution. I know the Bible says, you know, no harm shall come upon you. That doesn't mean I go run in the middle of the street or ongoing traffic. You know? Or you can take on serpents. That doesn't mean I go pick up snakes. Looking at, well, the Bible says they won't harm me. Now, I, I, the Bible is very clear about being cautious and about not being reckless. Proverbs 14, 6 says, The wise are cautious and avoid danger. Fools plunge ahead with reckless confidence. It says in 27, 12, The prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go and they suffer for it. So I understand the caution. I understand to be careful. I understand to be diligent. But I also understand that God has not given us a spirit of fear. I also know that greater is he that is in me that is he, than he that is in the world. I've also seen sicknesses that can kill people bow down to other people. I have seen God do miraculous. So I will not live my life in fear because I have God on my side. And I know that if he is for us, then who can be against us? Okay? <laughs> but what happens a lot of times... And my thing was this. I wonder if these wise men had never left the east, they would have never experienced the chance to worship the true king of kings. They would have stayed in that place. But what keeps us in a place? One thing is that fear keeps us there. You know, the first time I ever, you know, the first, the, in, in the Old Testament, a lot of men, prophets, they ran into caves. A cave, we know what a cave is, is a dark, damp, lonely place in the side of a mountain or a hill. You go into those places because either you're running, you're, uh, at, creatures go into caves because they're either running for, they're for shelter from a storm, they're being hunted for protection, they go there to isolate. People run into caves because they're afraid or they don't believe God or because they're hurt 
by somebody or they're offended by somebody. So they go into retreat because they've lost the passion and they've lost their fervor for their faith in God. You know, but here's the problem about keeping yourself out and disconnected from the things of God. There's a lot of times that cave that you run into, and I'm, and, and while well, I'm saying a cave as, as a physical example, I'm talking about a spiritual place in your mind. I'm talking about a place of isolation. It's the same thing. It's not... It's, it's a place that does not allow you no more to pursue your gifts or your desire or your passion for ministry, especially because you've protected yourself now from the hurts. Here's the problem, though, is a lot of times you're, you're, uh, what was meant to protect you, if you stay there too long, it becomes a, pr a prison for you, you know? You, 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 meant to, you meant to be there. You meant to isolate. You meant to protect yourself because you needed protection. You know, but God wants to say, but you stay there too long. What was protecting you will now imprison you. So you've got to get to a place back, back in your spirit where you're willing to open up the treasures God has given you and give them back to him so that you can be effective. And I, and I, and I have a feeling. Here, here, here's a, here, you know what's crazy? You know, and, I, and I'm going to read a, I'm going to read something here. I'm going to read. Uh, I'm going to read a story here. It's in Joshua, ten sixteen, and I'm going to I'm going to be quick because I, I I got a point to make before I'm done. It says, but these five kings fled and hid themselves in the cave at Makeda. Okay, you hide in the cave because you need protection. But then it says, and it was told Joshua saying, the five kings are found hid in the cave at Makeda. And Joshua said, roll great stones upon the mouth of the cave. So now what was protecting you has become a trap. It's, and set men by it for to keep them. And, and then it says, and stay ye not, but pursue after your enemies. And smite the hindmost of them. Suffer them not to enter into their cities. But the Lord your God had delivered them into your hand. And it came to pass when Joshua and the children of Israel had made an end of staying them with a very great slaughter till they were consumed. Here's the thing. If you allow the enemy to keep you isolated, to keep you separated, to keep you away from the things of God, to keep you from your desires, eventually it's going to trap your mind and eventually after that it's going to kill your faith. It starts as a safe haven, ends up as a prison, and then turns into a grave. And here's a problem, too, about running into caves. You know, is you never know who's going to be in there with you. <laughs> you know, I'm going to step into teaching mode for a minute. You don't know who's going to end up with you when you go into these bad places. So you don't want to stay there too long because you don't know who you're going to be sleeping with. <laughs> Who will you be getting your philosophy from? Who will be speaking into you? You, know, you don't know who's going to be there with you. You can't see good in the cave. There's no water in the cave. There's no light. That's what I want to say. What bothers me this is that the church cannot disconnect from the mission that God has for us. The church cannot disconnect from being the light of the world. See, there's so many people right now that are afraid, and there's so many people right now that don't have any type of hope. But who is going to be a light to them if the church is also afraid? Yeah. Okay. You half believe it. We'll get there. Okay. You know, because here's the thing. <laughs> Matthew 6, 23 says, But if thine eye be evil... The whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is the darkness? You know, how, does it, how, how great is the darkness if the people of light are full of darkness? You know, what do we share with the world? What do we share with other people if we also are afraid? Okay? I remember, um, I remember even from myself, I felt isolation at one time. I felt, you know, I, there, there was a time in my life I felt I just wouldn't preach again. Uh, that, was, that was a long time ago. You know, I, I, I just felt, I, and, I, and I did that as well. I decided I'm going to hide my treasure. I'm going to stay in the East, and I'm not going to share this with anybody. If I had to preach to myself once in a while, I'll do that. That's fine. But I'm going to stay in my cave 
because it's safe. I'm not going to I'm not going to try more than that. And you know what before too long it became a trap. Before too long the power of God was no longer strong. I couldn't I couldn't feel it the same way I used to. But thank God. Thank God God says come out of that place. Get out of there because we got to get to a place where we can freely and openly give ourselves and our lives to God. But we're never going to do that if we can't open up. And we're never going to do that if we protect ourselves from everything that comes our way. You know, not everything can hurt can hurt us to that place. Okay? I, I remember the story, and, and, I had, and I had to, you know, I had to preach to myself in that case because, you know, there's a man in the Bible, Obadiah, you know, remember Brother Tom? The Bible says that Obadiah feared the Lord. I always wonder how he did so. You know what Obadiah did one time? Things got crazy. Things got hot. You know, he took a hundred preachers and he hid them in a cave. <laughs> I wonder how that works out. <laughs> he said, okay, well, everything's going good here. Uh, hey, I, 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 I protected a hundred preachers. Where, where are they? They're in a cave. <laughs> what are they doing in a cave? Shh. <laughs> They're in a cave. How in the world... Can you be filled with the power of God? How in the world can you be filled with the anointing of God and say nothing and do nothing and preach nothing when everybody else is suffering? How in the world can that be? And I heard the word of God speak to me during that time saying, Lorenzo, the only thing worse than a dead preacher is a silent one. So you go ahead and stay silent and you go ahead and keep your gift when it was meant to enlighten somebody else. See, the world is never going to embrace truth and neither will you embrace the power that God has for you if you don't act upon what you hear. See, I can preach to you all day long till I'm blue in the face, but if you don't act on what you hear, nothing happens. See, I can't make you worship God. I can't make you praise God. I can't make you move make a move to God. I can't do any of that. You've got to make the decision that that's what you believe, and then you've got to act on it. You know what the Bible says that Peter said that he perceived the people had faith? I wonder how you perceive people have faith. You know how you do that? It's when you preach to people and they respond. It's when you talk to people and they say, I believe it. It doesn't just happen to you unless you embrace it. You know, Lincoln uh, did the Emancipation uh, Act way back. I, I can't even remember what it was, 1962, I think it was, something like that. I didn't write it down. He legally and judicially set all the minorities on the plantations free. Okay, this is our present history lesson. Okay, he, he legally and judicially let all the slaves on the plantation free, but... But I want you to listen to this because not everybody left the plantation. Okay? They didn't. And here's why. Problem. The first person says, hey, here's this piece of paper. The president says, you are free. <laughs> he doesn't know how to read. He looks at the papers. That's pretty nice looking paper. I like the handwriting. But I got work to do. <laughs> I've always been on the plantation. My mind is going to stay on the plantation. He goes back to being a slave. Second person comes back. He comes up to me and says, Look it, the president has told you you are free of slavery. So he says, All right, that's good to know, but he rejects it. <laughs> okay? He, he rejects the proclamation. But the third person comes up, he says, the president says, you are free to leave the plantation. He gets his wife, his kids, he's out of there. You know why? Because he's acted upon what somebody has told him. I can tell you all day you've been freed. I can tell you all day you've been healed. I can tell you all day you've been delivered. I can tell you all day you can have joy. I can tell you all day you can have peace in your home. You can have peace in your marriage. But if you don't believe it, it's not going to happen. All right. Are you thinking?
think I'm kidding, don't you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can't tell if you're smiling or not because you got them things on your face. I'm just going to pretend you all are smiling, okay? <laughs> but man, they all think I'm doing, I can, you're all, I can tell. The eyebrows tell me. The eyelashes, the lily lashes. <laughs> Is that right? Am I right? Lily lashes? <laughs> there you go. Got a stepdaughter. She loves makeup. <laughs> Christmas was all the way down both sides. <laughs> See, you're right. John 3.19. Okay, John 3.19. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. It says, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light. Now, one thing I want you to know before I, before I begin to wrap up. The world does not come against the church because of you. you know, the world hates the church and the things that the church does because of Jesus. And he told that to them. He said in John 7, 7, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me. You know why you come against so much conflict and so much persecution, not from only people, but from governments and from other types of things? The world does not hate you. The world hates Jesus. That's what Jesus told the disciples. He says, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me. It hates me because I testify of it that, it that its works are evil. He says, we've got to tell them the truth of the gospel. We've got to tell the world. We can't, we've got to tell it truth in love. I mean, you can't just beat people with truth. It's hard. <laughs> you've got to tell the truth in love. See, people never know they need to be saved if you don't tell them they're a sinner. And because I tell you you're a sinner doesn't mean I don't love you. It means that I'm trying to get you to realize that you need saving. A lot of people come to God and they don't think they need saving. They don't know what they need to get saved from. So we don't tell them anything because we say, well, no, you just do good and you'll be okay. There is no way to do good. I hate to tell you this. And let me, tell you, let me, let me, let me, let me mess with your minds just for a little bit. What, and you can all say, and, and I, and I want to help you. What is the opposite of evil? Yeah, some of you don't want to say nothing. Huh? What is the opposite of evil? Good? No, it isn't. Good is not the opposite of evil. You know why? Because evil people can do good things. See, evil people can do good things. Wealthy people and people that do despicable things donate lots of money to charities. You can be evil and still be good or do good. Here is the opposite. Here is the opposite of evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth comes to the light. Not he that does good, he that doeth truth. So what is the opposite of evil? It's truth. This is why we try to combat the evil works that come against your life. This is why we try to combat the sicknesses and the disease. And this is why we try to overcome the torment and the attacks that come against you with the word of God because only truth can counter evil. We got you to do truth. He says, but he that doeth truth comes to the light. And the light is what gets you out of the cave. Because it's okay to be in the cave for a bit as long as the cave don't get in you. Okay? It says, and so, so be he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. And to do the truth is to repent, to be baptized in Jesus' name, and to be more like him. Okay? You know, I, let me tell you what I know nobody's perfect none of us here are perfect I know sometimes we think we are but none of us here are perfect see but if we never come to the truth or the light it never illuminates the darkness in us 
that weighs us down. You ever wonder why you've been stuck in the same place so long in your mind? You want to live a better life. You want to do right. You want to make the right decisions. You want to do the better things. But you're stuck in the cave, in the darkness, in the east. You're stuck there. And God's saying, you've got to move my direction. Let my light guide your path. Because I can take you to a wealthy place where you can open up your treasures and find out things about you you didn't even know were there. Because you know, that's what God wants to do. He wants to pull him out of you. <laughs> you guys know that? You know that God has placed something in you from the day he spoke you and all this time he's been trying to pull that back out of you? <laughs> I'm looking for you. See, deep calls unto deep. You know, I, I tell people God goes house hunting when he comes looking for souls. So when he was looking for you, he was house hunting. He was looking a pl for a place he wants to live. Yeah. How many, when you house hunt, you look for the cheapest one on the corner? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, I want to, I, I got to wrap up here, but. I want to share this story here because to me it just resonated. Remember, a cave doesn't mean you ran off into the hills, into the pinnacles. <laughs> you know, a cave don't mean that necessarily. A cave means you've allowed so much darkness to get in you, you've stopped moving. It means you've allowed so much hurt to overtake you, you've stayed stuck in that place. You know, the wilderness for Moses was a cave, a big old cave. <laughs> You know what? 40 years he stayed in that place. And you know why he stayed there? Because he was hurt. Because somebody hurt him. Somebody that he loved hurt him. And let me tell you something. I just feel this. Let me tell you something about that evil spirit of unforgiveness. <laughs> if you can't let hurts go, it is going to leave you locked up. And it imprisons nobody but you. That's the sad part. The person you're mad at don't even care. And you're torn apart every day. And the person that did the damage, he doesn't even know what he doesn't even know you're hurt. And Moses, God had given him a dream, a vision, a desire, a passion inside of him. And you know, one day he saw two Jews fighting. And he went and broke it up. And one of them told him, well, who do you think you are? <laughs> and here's the thing. I'm going to read it because it's powerful. Acts 7, 25, it says this. For he supposed, here's the big problem, folks. For he, he supposed his brethren would have understood. <laughs> isn't, that the sh isn't that the calamity? And sometimes you do things with the right motive. You do things with a purity of heart. You do it because God gave you a passion and you're thinking and you're hoping everybody understands why you did it. But they don't understand motive. Only God does, people. So they, don't, they only judge your actions. They don't know your heart. They're judging your actions, not your motives. And that's what Moses' problem was. He supposed his brethren would understand, but they did not. You're going to get yourself in a lot of hurt when you suppose everyone's going to understand why you do what you do. Because yeah. not everybody knows your motive. They can just judge your actions. Our brethren don't know our hearts. Your family don't know your hearts. They truly don't. Not the, so you don't even know your hearts. How's your family going to know them? <laughs> you know? So you do something, and, they, and then they say something offensive to you, and you thought they should have understood. So you know what? The, so it goes on to say this. He thought they would understand that God had meant for him to be, be a deliverer. He thought they would understand that, but they didn't. It says, and the next day he showed himself unto them, and they strove, and would have set them one at again, saying, Sir, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? See, Moses is trying to be the deliverer. 
that God had ordained him to be. It says, but he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away. Now here's, here's where it is, fellas. It's somebody that he cared for shoved him away. That's a big shove. 40 years it cost him of isolation, disconnection, and loneliness. Because somebody he loved hurt him. Okay? And he was meant to be a deliverer, and he was meant, he was meant to do the mighty things of God, but instead he retreated. He retreated. You know, and sometimes I wonder, folks, God has given you so much power. He's given this church so much direction. He's given this church so much anointing. But I feel like some of us have been shoved. <laughs> Who shoved you? <laughs> Who shoved you out? And Who told you you didn't have? Here's the problem about wilderness is it changes your whole attitude. He used to be on fire. He used to have desire to deliver. He used to have desire to guide. And now he's content, the Bible says, to be a shepherd. You know, what have you settled for? You know, that's what I want. What have you settled? And who shoved you? Who shoved you so hard that you no longer want to live for God? You no longer, you no longer perceive that ministry with the desire you used to have. Who shoved you? Okay. I'm going places I didn't really want to go, but I'm going to finish. I ran out of time a long time ago. <laughs> okay. Moses had a dream. Okay. And I know everybody in here has a dream. And I'm not talking about seeing things in your sleep, I'm talking about the vision or the picture that God has shown you, how you think your home should be, how you think your life should be, how you think your ministry should be, how you think your children should be. God has given all of you a dream from way back. Moses had a dream, but a rejection from people that he loved shoved him away from it. It can rip your heart and your desire if you let it. It can rip it right out of you. So you might say, what does this have to do with the three wise men? It's because if they never move, they never get to the king. If they never move, they never see the light to guide. If you never take action on what you hear, and you never get out of that place that has trapped you, you're never going to get to the place of worship where God reveals your treasures to you. See, I've always understood the treasures were for Jesus. The way I hear the story now, the treasures were for them. <laughs> I'm trying to show you what's in you. <laughs> Which, okay. All right. All right. The saddest thing about Moses in that time was he became content. And that's the worst thing to do is to be happy being unhappy. <laughs> to be happy being unfulfilled. To be happy not quite getting there. You know, and I can tell you what, you can have a good job, good house, good health, good all them things. If you think that's enough, I know it's not enough. I've been there, done that. I bought the shirt. <laughs> you, know, you know, it isn't enough. <laughs> It's not enough because you just obtain that thing. It's not enough. There is a spirit that calls to us for greater things. And it wasn't enough for Moses either. But what changes that and what brings you out of that is there's a burning bush experience somewhere looming in the distance saying it's time for you to reignite that fire inside of you. It's time for you to move out of that place. It's time for you to do what you were called to do. It's time for you to be who you're supposed to be. Stop making excuses for why you can't. And start making excuses for why you can. Now, I promise I'm going to finish now. Matthew 5.14, KJV, and you can stand. See, if you stand, I got to finish. See? See, so if you... So if you guys had have stood a long time ago, we'd have been finished. 
<laughs> that's, the, that's the secret. I just let you get into my secret. Matthew 5.14 says this. And this is us, church. This has got to be us, especially in this particular time. This has to be us. It says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherefore shall it be salted? I know the young people don't like this, but you can tell them, Brother Lorenzo, he's salty. <laughs> yeah, you don't like, young people don't like to be I need Google now just to understand young people language. You know, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but salty. Young people don't like to be salty or they, you know, but you know, you got to be salty. <laughs> According to the Bible, you need to be salty. So you can say I'm salty if you want. Yeah, I'm not salty, but Lorenzo is. Oh, it says, because you know what? We were meant to bring savor to the earth. Okay? It says, you are the light of the world, and a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. You know, you only glorify God when you let your light shine. That's the only time we do it, you know. You know, if we're offended and hurt by every little thing and decide it's going to stop us in our tracks, you know, we stop becoming that light God had intended us to become. And this world needs light. I tell people all the time right here, I'm not here to... I'm not here to change you. I'm not here to judge you. I'm just here to turn the light on. You know, that's all I can do. You know, so I encourage you. you know, um, I have 0, 0.0 seconds left. 12 minutes ago. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that's my thought for today. And, you know, I know, you know, <clears throat> Where, your hand, where you are, you know, I know it's different. You know, we won't lay hands on each other right now. Right now. <laughs> you know, but where you are, you know, you reach up to God. God can touch you where you are. Those of you that are out there, I encourage you to reach out for God where you are. Be a light where you are. And if you were encouraged by this message and you're encouraged by the move of God in your life and the call of God in your life, I want you to say this prayer while you're there. Say, God, help me be that light. God, help me come out of that dark place. God, I want to move in your direction. God, I want to worship you. God, I want you to open the treasures in my heart. And I want you to find you in me. And if you've prayed that prayer, I want you to get in contact with somebody at the Encounter Church. You can DM us. You can send a Facebook message. You can call one of us, see us on the street. We will gladly reach out to you and talk to you about your next steps. And with that, I want to thank you for the time you've taken. We bless you. We pray for you in Jesus' name. tuning in today. If this sermon touched you in any way, why don't you comment, I've decided, in the comments below so our amazing team can connect with you and get you the steps on how to get baptized. We want to stay connected with you, and the ways we can do that is through social media. So follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram so we can stay connected with you, and you can listen into what other announcements we have throughout the week. If you want to be a part of the Encounter Church, you can also give through generosity. So click the link below so we can show you the ways on how to give here at the Encounter Church. With all that being said, we hope to see you next week, and stay connected with us. God bless.